Good morning, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to be here. And uh, you've heard so many things about Hodgkin's. Uh, that's, that's good. Uh, that's my favorite disease to, to treat. However, I was asked for this first presentation here not to talk on Hodgkin's that much, but rather focus on non-Hodgkin lymphoma because that's a more common disease. And then those few of you who have Hodgkin's and are here in the room or are interested will then later join me to discuss Hodgkin's in more detail. So I will try to give you an overview on the two most common non-Hodgkin lymphoma, that is diffuse last B cell lymphoma and follicular lymphoma. And um, then later on, as I said, uh, we will discuss Hodgkin's. So these are cancers of the lymphatic systems. These tumor cells derive from lymphocytes. And this cartoon shows this. Usually the cells where this disease derives from are either in the lymph nodes or in the bone marrow. And they can stay there for many, many years without doing anything. And they might change to a sort of pre-malignant state. And then one day or another it happens. They start to grow, dividing quickly. And you feel then later on that something is going where it shouldn't be growing, a lymph node for instance. And that's then when you have this disease. And there are so many different types of lymphoma with different treatments and different characteristics ranging from diseases you never ever have to treat at all because they are, even though they are a malignancy, they are rather benign, so they sit there and you don't need any treatment. In contrast, there are diseases that grow fast, very quickly. You can see them growing every day. So there's a plethora of different diseases, and I don't want to cover all these different diseases, that's for sure, uh, but focus on the most relevant one. And this is uh, showing you the subtypes. The yellow one is aggressive lymphoma, diffuse large B cell lymphoma. This is going to be my first topic. And the red one is follicular lymphoma. This is going to be my second topic, and then, as I said later on, it's Hodgkin's in the breakout session. So clearly, and that's what you alluded to already, when treating this, these diseases, it really depends on how aggressive the disease is and how the chances for cure are. The higher the chances for cure, and that's true for many lymphomas these days, the more we have to really balance our treatment, because Yes, the more aggressive the treatment is, the higher the chances of the, the lymphoma going away. But then, on the other hand, the higher the risk later on uh, to develop side effects, maybe even other cancers or organ damage. So that's a difficult balance for us doctors when we plan new treatments, when we discuss new treatments, how to find the best balance. We don't want to under-treat the patient, we want to cure the patient, However, on the other hand, we don't want to damage healthy tissue too much. There is always some, some damage with chemotherapy or radiation. So <clears throat> the treatment of non-Hodgkin lymphoma, if we're not talking about the very aggressive ones, is rather easy for you to remember because that's one magic regimen and that's called AIR-CHOP. AIR stands for rituximab and CHOP are the uh, different drugs that are being given in there. So I assume that quite a few of, he, of you here in the room have received this or variants thereof. And this chemotherapy is usually given in two or three big intervals and six to eight cycles of treatment are given if you are younger. If you are older than 60 or 70 you might receive less treatment. And the real breakthrough and real improvement for many cancer treatments, and it was lymphoma first, was due to a monoclonal antibody. This shows you a monoclonal antibody. This is something we have in our blood. This is to protect us from viral infections, for instance. So we have many, many monoclonal antibodies. Uh, and these antibodies were initially uh, identified to help us diagnose different types of cancer. Because different types of cancer, and lymphoma in particular, 
show uh, proteins that are structures on the surface of the tumor cell that are being recognized by these monoclonal antibodies. And it was a major breakthrough then to really be able to develop antibodies against a specific target. This is being done in animal systems or other experimental systems and then eventually you find the right one you want to have. But for many, many years, and I've been working with antibodies for a, quite a long time, for many years, the medical community say, yes, monoclonal antibodies, great for diagnosis, but treatment, no way. You can't use it for treatment. It doesn't work. Because all the trials and uh, attempts to use monoclonal antibodies as a treatment failed in the 80s and early 90s. That has changed. That has changed with the introdu introduction of a monoclonal antibody called rituximab. That's an antibody against a structure on B cell lymphoma cells. And this antibody on its own can destroy these cells by various mechanisms. I don't want to go into too much detail here. And this antibody really has changed the landscape in that then all, all other cancer diseases and cancer doctors looked for antibodies for their diseases that are happening. So we have an, uh, quite a number of monoclonal antibodies today, but the most uh, relevant one for lymphoma still at this stage and sort of the pioneer uh, was this one was rituximab. And uh, when this was then becoming available, uh, there were first data in sort of smaller number of patients and the French group then was the first one to really combine chemotherapy with such an antibody, with rituximab. And this are, is the setup of such a clinical trial. Some of you might have undergone a clinical trial. This was a first line, so not a sort of uh, relapse setting, but first line patients, patients with aggressive lymphoma, diagnosed, freshly diagnosed. And they had the choice of this old standard, that is CHOP alone, this chemotherapy, or CHOP plus this new antibody. That was, was the treatment, and this was done in younger patients, young, patients younger than 60 years. And this is the result. This is long-term follow-up now, and you can clearly see that the orange line, that's the combination, air chop that's rituximab plus CHOP, is significantly better and the median survival there is 8.4 years and that's much much better than with CHOP alone that was only three and a half years and I remember when these data were first reported I had was lucky to be there in, in America at a large meeting where 20,000 doctors were watching and half of them couldn't believe it. They say, no, that's not true. They are faking the data. That can't be true. With this antibody, these good results plus chemotherapy, we don't believe this. But this story is true. It has come full circle. And as I said, monoclonal antibodies are being used now in many, many different cancers, also in Hodgkin's, but that's a different story we talk about later. So really, that has become the backbone of treatment for lymphoma patients, this combination of CHOP. There are risk factors. I don't think I have to go into more details here to sort of target treatment to the aggressiveness of this lymphoma. And this shows this. So it is age dependent. Younger patients have a little different treatment than elderly patients. On the other hand, they can also tolerate much more chemotherapy than older patients. So you see down here that nearly all patients receive this CHOP plus rituximab. It's just a matter of how many cycles. And then patients with rather high risk, older patients who have a very aggressive tumor that's, that's, that's difficult to treat, could go on to evaluate new drugs, test new drugs, because there's an area where we are not happy yet. We're not, we don't think this is, treatment is good enough although for many others it is very good. I'll show you curves in a minute. So I don't want to go there. So here you see 
These are not German data. I, I wear sort of the French uh, uh, tie today. And these are French data from Baton Coffee's group, the JLA. So they treated, and this was the group that pioneered this ARTSHOP, this rituximab chemotherapy combination. They treated more than 7,000 patients with diffuse large B cell lymphoma over these last 20 years or so. And then you see that many, many of these patients up here do very well. They do not re respond and they have a life expectancy that's rather similar actually to an, a similar population without cancer. However, you also see that patients uh, relapse and that patients do not respond well at all. And these are the patients that have a poorer prognosis. These are survival curves. You might have seen this before. So you see the little dots here. So all, each of the dot is a patient, is a given patient. Uh, and um, this is how clinical trials are being documented and compared. So clearly, a lot of this, you can't even see the, the single, single dots here. A lot of patients do very well with aggressive lymphoma. However, 30 or 40 percent or so still do not that well. And there is a need to improve. And there are possible approaches to improve the treatment of these patients. This is shown on this slide. So, hello possible um, attempts, current attempts to improve the treatment are u to use new drugs. We are constantly seeing new drugs that's usually developed by the pharmaceutical industry because uh, the and also by the university hospitals, that's for sure. Uh, but most of the new drugs don't work that well. They don't work that well. They don't get into patients at all. Just the very best ones get into treatment and clinical trials. So new drugs is an issue and more aggressive chemotherapy is another issue. We heard from uh, Professor Griggs that uh, we treat our Hodgkin patients rather aggressively. There are two different approaches. Uh, so that's also being evaluated certainly in this type of lymphoma, more aggressive chemotherapy. And then uh, certainly new combination of chemotherapy and antibodies are looked at. These are again these curves, survival curves of French patients treated with more aggressive chemotherapy. And you see that the level now is, is rising and rising and depending on the um, type of, of disease and depending on what we look at, this is overall survival. This is pretty good. You see the curves are very high. Uh, they can't get higher than 100%, 100% survival. That's not possible, certainly. But some of these curves here, for instance, are close to that. So that shows you how effective this is. And this is a comparison of more aggressive chemotherapy in this case plus rituximab with ARTSHOP. So that seems to work, but that's only good for young and fit patients. And that's not the standard yet, it's just an example of more aggressive treatment resulting in better results. That's not always the case. It can be the other way around because it's more toxic, but this seems to work in this particular malignancy. One more recent question and issue is maintenance. That means you have your chemotherapy, you are in remission, the doctor, doctors can't detect any cancer anymore, but you are in a risk group, the doctors talk to you about it, a group that has some risk to have a relapse. And that's the last thing I guess you want after having gone through chemotherapy and maybe radiotherapy, you don't want a relapse. So. Several approaches have been uh, uh, looked at in order to prevent relapse. And here on this slide you see possible or possibilities. So one possibility is again using just rituximab, just this antibody, which is given as infusion or can now be given subcutaneously. That's an option and there are new drugs. Uh, but unfortunately most of these drugs in the last 10 years or so, did not show that this maintenance treatment is, is effective enough. 
Um, so that's not decided yet. However, there are uh, more recent data from Austria and they show, as you see here, that this maintenance seems to be doing the job now with longer follow-up. Doing the job means helping the patient to stay in remission, not having a relapse. But that, on the other hand, means that you have to have infusion with this rituximab antibody every two or three months. Uh, so it's not standard treatment yet. That's still something that is in the, on the focus uh, on radar right now. But that might be something in the future. And when we talk about the other disease in a minute, you see that it works there in less aggressive lymphoma, in follicular lymphoma. So right now the research is on to find new partners for this chemotherapy and, re and, and rituximab, ARCHOP. So ARCHOP plus X, what, what is going to be X? And this has been the research for many, many years and not really until now uh, an ideal partner for this treatment has been found. Despite many, many attempts, it's not so easy. Um, and uh, you have sometimes a breakthrough where nobody expected that, but on other occasions it takes long. And you see that there are many different drugs listed here as potential partners for this chemotherapy and antibody treatment. Uh, but that's research right now, and we will have to do a little bit better in order to find the next potent and hopefully even better tolerated drug in order to get away from the chemotherapy. That's the goal, get away from the chemotherapy. But then on the other hand, we don't want you to, to have a higher risk because we reduce chemotherapy too much. We want you still to be cured, but maybe in the future with less side effects. And that's the major research that's being done. And um, that is sort of a cartoon of the infrastructure and the, the uh, different modes of action within the cell, within the cancer cell, that is uh, maintaining this cell that helps to survive and grow. And more and more these mechanisms are being identified. It's really very, very complex. It's getting more and more complex. So even the doctors don't understand all these mechanisms anymore at all. Different cancers have different mechanisms. But some of the mechanisms were identified and helped now to develop better reagents, tablets, tablets that can eventually cure or at least control the disease. That's still at very early stages, but there are so many interesting drugs around now that I'm pretty sure that in the future the treatment will be safer and better targeted. That's the magic word now, targeted treatment. We don't give chemotherapy uh, that destroys also healthy cells, but we target the treatment to the tumor cell, to the individual tumor cell. And that's, that's the major focus of research in cancer today. So I don't want to talk about relapse. Uh, you hear more about relapse later on. Just want to summarize what is the current stage of this particular disease, diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So we need new combinations for these 30 to 40 percent of patients who do not that well. Uh, this is the focus of the research and this is particularly needed for patients who do not, do not respond to the first treatment or who do have a relapse. Uh, and that's why a combination of these drugs with new drugs is being researched and we really hope to be able to come forward with better treatments, even better treatments in the future, and increase the number of cured patients with this malignancy and others. So that was the first disease. I move on then to the next disease, that's follicular. I think you can have questions to both diseases after the presentation if you want to. Um, so that's follicular is a different disease. It's also a lymphoma, it's the second most common lymphoma but it's a more benign disease. It's a rather benign disease in many patients, so some of these patients do not need 
any treatment at all and their life expectancy is as good as mine or others who don't have cancer. So that makes it even more difficult to decide if you have cancer, the doctor tells you you have lymphoma, but you don't need treatment, I think you are confused in the first place because you want the disease to go away, don't, you don't want to run around with lymphoma. That's a difficult decision, but it's one of the questions for this disease, for follicular lymphoma, for you, do I need treatment or don't I? What does the doctor tell you? So, and the notion that treatment is not needed is based on rather old data with very long follow-up, 10, 15 years. Here you see that these patients were just followed, observation, careful follow-up. They were seeing their doctor every three or six months at least. Uh, and others were treated with sort of moderate chemotherapy and you see there's no difference whatsoever. And their prognosis is good and these patients here, 20, 30 percent or so of these patients don't or have not received any treatment at all, that's what I said, and have a life expectancy that's similar to those of healthy patients. That's the question. So who should receive treatment with this disease, with follicular lymphoma, early on, and who needs, uh, doesn't need any treatment at that stage, just needs watch and wait. This has become more complicated in, in recent years because in the past it was chemotherapy only, now it's rituximab or another antibody. And these are the, is the current research, what if I don't have with this cancer, with this follicular lymphoma, if I don't have chemotherapy, but rather this rituximab, which is a more biological reagent, doesn't cause your hair to fall out, you just need these infusions every three weeks. It also has side effects, there's no drug that has no side effects, but it's much better tolerated and it can improve the control of the disease. That's what's shown here. You see that the, there is no sign of disease anymore at all. The survival is not different, but patients might feel better if the disease is gone away. However, they have to go to the hospital on a regular basis to get this infusion. That's uh, not solved yet, but uh, that's um, in the discussion and the problem for us doctors is that this is a, a, a slow-growing tumor. That means you need to wait for 5 years, 10 years, 15 years before you have the answer. If you have a fast-growing tumor, you have the answer if you have a new drug or a new combination much more quickly. But that's not your problem, that's our problem, but we try to really find measures to uh, improve that. Right, Th this is a, a busy slide. It gives you the reasons to start treatment if you have this disease. There were or are factors that were identified over these years that guide us doctors and your patients in the need of treatment. Because if you develop symptoms, uh, like f you lose weight, you start to sweat, um, you have fever, or your blood cells, uh, your blood count is no good, and so forth, you see it over there, or you, your tumors grow rather quickly by sudden, these are reasons to start chemotherapy and uh, combination with rituximab because that tells us that the disease is getting more aggressive or is, is a more aggressive variant. Whereas in the other patients with no symptoms at all and no growth, that's a, that's a better chance to wait and not do anything. If you can sort of tolerate the psychological problem of knowing that you have cancer and nobody's doing something about it. That's this watch, watch and wait strategy. So, these are reasons to treat this disease, this follicular lymphoma, uh, and um, certainly there are other attempts to improve treatment, and I'll show you a few slides what is being done there. So, you see that there is the induction treatment, as it is called, that is aiming to get rid of most of the tumor cells, few might then be still around and they sh would be tackled with what we call consolidation. 
or maintenance. And that is aimed at eventually really getting rid of the last tumor cell, which is more difficult in this disease than in faster growing diseases, malignancies. And one drug that has recently challenged the combination of CHOP, <coughs> I told you CHOP is the gold standard for most these lymphoma, there is a new drug, which is a rather old drug, developed in East Germany before the Iron Curtain came down. It's called Bendamustin. Uh, and this Bendamustin is um, a mixture of sort of two different uh, drugs, mechanisms, and we from Western Germany were sort of arrogant initially, said, well, <coughs> we don't think this, this drug from East Germany can be very good. But we had to eat our words because the drug is very good. And I will show you a little bit of that. And this drug was compared with this CHOP chemotherapy, so Bendamustin, that's the name of the drug, compared with CHOP. And that's, um, again, a clinical trial, and they included not only follicular lymphoma, but also other rather similar diseases. And that's the curve. This is, again, a survival curve with many, many patients seen on, on this slide. And that's the tumor control. That's not overall survival. Overall survival was rather similar. But you have a better tumor control with this drug in combination with rituximab. So that's called BR, B for um, Bendamustin. And that means that's a challenge. That's a challenge uh, for, for CHOP in this disease. And it's a challenge not only because it gives a better tumor control, but also because it's better tolerated. And the most important thing about this drug is you keep your hair. The hair would not fall out. And that's for the men, it may be less a problem. For, for some others, it might be a very big problem. And if you have a drug that is better tolerated, you keep your hair, that makes you wonder, why should I then have another chemotherapy where I know my hair will fall out? So that's a challenge. And that's, uh, on the other hand, uh, an alternative for many of, of these patients or you who have follicular lymphoma with this drug called bendamustin. But I must say that all these achievements we made over these years were due to mainly to randomized clinical trials. That might sound terrible to you, uh, but that's what it is. It is the difference between a standard chemotherapy or standard treatment and a new treatment. And this new treatment might scare you, but it has been looked at by many, many instances, ethical committees, committees where patients are part of, and authorities. So it's not, you're not a guinea pig when you are in a clinical trial. And um, I think the, the notion, at least in Europe, has changed. And I think that's true also for Australia, that more and more people understand that a trial is good or can be good because it yields the evidence then the next, if you might not profit from the trial, your, the next patient who has the disease profits because then we know if this works or not and this can be used for the treatment of the next patient. So that's why uh, clinical trials are very important in order to really find out what, what is better and what is not. And this has really helped advance medicine substantially and it's not us anymore saying, well, I know exactly what you need. It's in my guts. I know it. Believe me. That's not medicine anymore. We are basing many of our decisions on evidence that is data from clinical trials, from large clinical trials, well done clinical trials. So that's important. And that's here is an example, another example of such a trial that compared rituximab maintenance in this slow growing lymphoma, follicular lymphoma. So patients were randomized between observation. This was by chance observation, so no chemo, no rituximab, I mean, or rituximab maintenance. And you see here that this results in better tumor control. That's, again, not overall survival. It's tumor control, so a substantial improvement. And this has led to 
this treatment, rituximab again, I'm not paid by Roche at all, so don't mm -hmm. think that. Um, it's a good, good antibody though. It has resulted in uh, this maintenance becoming standard for patients with this disease because it controls the disease better and maybe results with longer follow-up in cure in some of the patients. And that's the overall survival and you see there that uh, this overall survival even at many years after treatment is pretty impressive for a malignant disease. And the question now is, and we come back to Bendamustin again, can we further improve on, on this by doing even longer maintenance treatment? It's now two years, so they are doing now a trial when they give four years of maintenance. It's a long time, you have to go to the doctor all the time, but you might profit from that in that the disease does not come back or maybe after 15 years when there will be better drugs around, maybe, hopefully. So that's, that's an experimental study at this stage. Two years or four years of maintenance. And this is a very, very complicated slide, um, but this shows you the many new drugs that are around in this lymphoma. It's probably not even complete. So that is the hope that many of these drugs have already shown how effective they can be in lymphoma patients. And that is the hope that one of these drugs will form the next partner for ARCHOP or a combination of chemo and uh, immunotherapy with rituximab and maybe in the future replace chemotherapy gradually more and more and that trials are being done right now to do this, particular in this <coughs> follicular lymphoma. So this summarizes the second disease, the follicular lymphoma disease. So there is still a role for watch and wait in patients with no symptoms. Um, if treatment is needed, we have to look at the risk factors to create the need, the indication for treatment. I showed you that also in this disease the combination of chemotherapy and rituximab is standard. It's mainly ARCHOP, but this bendamustin is challenging the CHOP chemotherapy. Um, I showed you that this bendamustin gives better tumor control and is better tolerated. So chemotherapy plus rituximab plus maintenance is more or less standard right now. There is no more role for aggressive chemotherapy and transplant in these patients, at least not upfront. In the relapse setting, you might hear this uh, about uh, this later on. And importantly, there are so many interesting and, and very well working uh, targeted new drugs that we really hope that in maybe not next year, but the year thereafter, we know more about this and we might have another very interesting, better, effective, better to tolerated drug to treat these lymphoma patients. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention and all the best. Thanks, uh, Andreas. We're actually finished a bit early, so we might have time for a couple of questions. I'm just going to give you a slightly Australian perspective about a couple of things that you said, so, um, and a personal perspective. So I think one of the great challenges we have with diffuse large cell lymphoma is treating our older patients because probably half the patients that we see with large cell lymphoma are over the age of 70 and they've often got comorbidities, means that they've got diabetes or heart disease or lung disease. And to be able to give them full dose chemotherapy with our standard CHOP-like treatment is often very difficult and I think that's a real area for improvement is to try and find new cleverer therapies that don't involve toxic chemotherapy particularly in this age group that don't tolerate standard treatment. Uh, the second thing I'll, I'll say is you, I know you showed a slide suggesting from the Austrian group that giving maintenance rituximab may be of benefit in some patients with large cell lymphoma after they've treated remission. In Australia that's not approved so we can get eight cycles of rituximab uh, for patients with newly diagnosed large cell lymphoma and that's it. 
Um, so often in Australia, generally we give six samples of, of chemotherapy and then in selected patients we may give the other two, up to eight, uh, at the end of their treatment. But we, we can't use maintenance at the moment. You have to remember that, that maintenance treatment given every three months for two years, which is the standard protocol. In fact, some hospitals around Australia give treatment every two months for two years in low-grade lymphoma. That costs about thirty to forty thousand dollars. So it's not each time you get rituximab, it's about three to four thousand dollars of taxpayers' money. So uh, one has to be very conscious in in a health environment uh, where there's limited dollars to go around about how you use it most effectively. And it's a controversial area. That's the reality that we face. The second thing, just in, in low-grade lymphoma, again, the study showing watch and wait versus rituximab, which showed that those patients who got rituximab tended to have more control of their disease early on. Um, rituximab is not yet approved in Australia for that <coughs> indication, so rituximab in combination with chemotherapy is only improved in patients with advanced stage follicular lymphoma, what's called stage 3 or 4, so not for early stage disease. And those patients have to be symptomatic, so they have to have symptoms, and they, it's only approved in combination with chemotherapy. So single agent rituximab in early stage low-grade lymphoma is not approved in Australia and you can't get it. Um, so I'll give you the reality, I'm just telling you how it is. Um, bendamustine, so the bendamustine versus uh, CHOP data in low-grade lymphoma looks very promising. Bendamustine is not approved in Australia yet. Generally in Australia about two years behind America. So, so most drugs that get approved, the, the sequence is it gets approved in the US and then within a year it's usually approved in Europe. Uh, and then it takes another year to get approved in Australia, if we're lucky. So bendamustines are not available. However, there have been numerous clinical trials around Australia using bendamustine uh, in combination chemotherapy with flick lymphoma. And I know some patients in this room have received it. Um, and we've, got, uh, we've just uh, concluded a, a trial in Austin and other centres using bendamustine in combination with either rituximab or new monoclonal antibody therapy in lymphoma with really uh, really excellent results and, and of the about 12 or 13 patients we've used bendamustine in combination with a new rituximab like antibody, we haven't had any relapses at all so far. So I think hopefully that, that's a drug that will become available but it's not yet available on the PBS. So off study, unless you pay for it, you can't get it. Um, and I think it's uh, what Professor Ingert said in, in his last uh, couple of slides, all these drugs down the bottom here. So brutinib, ardilalisib, I was in Sydney yesterday for a meeting discussing clinical trials with ardilalisib and this new ABT199 uh, drug which was really pioneered at the Royal Eliza Hall Institute in Melbourne. Um, there are a number of clinical trials, in fact there's competition for clinical trials. So if, for example, if you have relapsed follicular lymphoma, I can tell you in Melbourne in the next six months there will be at least three trials involving, one involving a brutinib, one involving ardilalisib, one involving ABT199. So there's actually um, fantastic access in Australia for these new drugs in follicular lymphoma. And this slide wouldn't have existed two years ago. So there's a huge expansion in these drugs which are much cleverer drugs and focus specifically on, on abnormalities with the lymphoma pathway rather than sort of the blunderbuss approach that one gets with general chemotherapy. And so for example, the Austin in the next month for patients with relapsed follicular lymphoma, we are going to start a trial of bendamustine, not currently available on the PBS, but available on the trial, rituximab, and then randomise the patients getting a brutinib or not. Um, so a study to, to demonstrate whether a brutinib has activity in relapsed follicular lymphoma. So, and other institutions around Melbourne will be doing similar sorts of studies. So it's a really exciting area for clinical trials in, in, uh, in a whole variety of lymphomas. So that's my little spiel about the local situation. And you hear at the, the last session when we were talking about clinical trials, I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. Um, and there's also an app you can download on your iPhone, which we should keep turned off during the lecture, um, which uh, you can actually download the clinical trials that are available in Melbourne in haematology, and I'll show you some slides about that later on. So if you're one of those, I was, I was driving through the city last night looking out the, the taxi window at how many patients under the age of 40 who were single walking along either listening to their iPhone or on their iPhone, I reckon it was about 80%. So we are sort of a, uh, we are sort of a technological society here. So if you, are, if you do have an iPhone, you can download all the clinical trials according to type of lymphoma, institution, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's an initiative that that's, I think is very constructive. Okay, so 
Uh, any, any questions you would like to ask Professor Ingard from his talk? Now, I know you'll have the opportunity in the other thing, but yes, we've got some time now. Um, talk up nice and loudly, please. First of all, I think it's really refreshing the watch and wait on the people that have won this fact that that's now being addressed and it's not race, racing into treatment. I've got a good question. Um, it was really interesting the fact that a lot of people have been eyeing lymphoma that is symptomless and it's only when it goes to malignant that then you start to get the clinical problems. Um, keeping in mind that the research dollars driven by drugs, is there anyone anywhere in the world, here or in Australia, that's looking at what triggers the change from benign to malignant, which affects the incidence of lymphoma and also the people on watch and wait? I mean, are we looking at environmental factors or other disease processes? Is there anyone researching that? Because it can't be dollar driven by drugs but is there research going into that area of what causes the lymphoma to start in the body anyway? Yeah, that's a very, very important question. And um, when I was a medical student at that time even, and that's uh, not just uh, one or two years ago, it's a little bit longer, we were discussing how cancer develops. and. Uh, in some areas, it's rather frustrating that we've not really made much progress. But I also showed you some of the mechanisms within the cell, and uh, um, so that shows you that a lot of understanding how cancer cells work, what the reason behind it, some of these these um, events are being uh, found, are being identified. The problem is that it's not just one reason or one factor that then results in cancer or lymphoma. There are many more reasons, there are many more events. So it's a combination of a couple of reasons that we know risks to develop uh, a cancer or lymphoma uh, and there are environmental factors for instance, and that, that's a gimmick in a way, but uh, it used to uh, well, could be identified a ri as risk factor, women dyeing uh, their hair, colouring their hair. In the US that was an independent and very strong risk factor, so maybe that has to do with the dye they were using there. Uh, also people work on the fields might be at a higher risk, that I think depends then on the, on the uh, poison that might have been used and certainly the environment plays a role, radiation, so if you sit in the sun all day long plays a role, your uh, eating and drinking habits play a role, if, you, if you're a heavy drinker and if you have a, are a heavy smoker then you are at higher risk to develop cancer or not responding well to treatment. If you do sports that's actually the best thing these days to do, you do sports, you don't have to be a marathon runner, but if you can do sports, let's say three times a week, walking or maybe playing tennis, depends on how fit you are, how young you are, that's the best thing to support your immune system, that can sort of check or keep the cancer in check, that's important, but I'm talking a lot here, but the, the short message is for most cancers, the reason is not clear, for some it is. For instance, there is a disease such as CML, chronic myeloid leukemia, which was uncurable 15 years ago, maybe only with allergenic transplant, and now these patients can take a tablet because the exact mechanism why this disease uh, was developing was identified, and this tablet, or what is in the tablet, blocks this pathway and cures or at least controls the disease. So that's an example of a very specific and very effective treatment. That's not a lymphoma, but we also have similar tablets now for, for lymphoma patients. But yes, you're right, for many, many cancers, unfortunately, the reason was not identified despite many, many dollars, billion dollars worldwide going into res this research, because if we find the reason, this can then lead to a specific and successful treatment.
Perhaps just a comment. I mean, I don't think any lymphoma is benign. So lymphoma, by definition, is a malignancy. So I suppose perhaps your question is, how can we get those patients with a low-grade lymphoma that may transform to a more aggressive lymphoma? Which is a very reasonable question. So uh, lymphoma is a genetically complex disease. It's, it's naive to think there's this one thing that's wrong in the lymphoma cell. If you do very complex and molecular analyses of changes within the genes within the cell, there are often 10 or 20 different genetic pathways that are disturbed. And yes, the answer to your question is, yes, there is a lot of research in trying to predict which genes which are abnormal in particularly low-grade lymphoma may predict for more aggressive disease later on. I think that research is in embryonic phase of development, but it's happening. Perhaps it's time for one more question before we have our cup of tea. Nice and loud, so everybody can hear. Uh, in your experience, is there any link between celiac disease and lymphoma? Celiac disease? Mm, there might be some higher risk, yes, because it's a sort of chronic immune stimulation with this disease, and chronic immune stimulation is no good. That's like smoking, in a way, is also chronic immune stimulation, and the lymphoma derives from the immune system. Lymphocytes are part, crucial part of our immune system. That's why it, uh, there is some link. It's not the only reason, but there is higher risk. There are other diseases that put you at higher risk. If you have to take steroids, for instance, for years for autoimmune diseases or arthritis, that also increases your risk to develop a lymphoma. Not necessarily, but there is some higher risk. Uh, and um, yeah, immunosuppression in general puts you at higher risk. So, so people with celiac disease who have poorly controlled celiac disease have ongoing inflammation in their bowel, are clearly at risk of a, a particular sort of, of what's called a T-cell lymphoma, which is r relatively rare of their bowel. So if you've got celiac disease, it's very important to keep um, your gluten-free diet going so you have less inflammation in your bowel and your risk is less.